the Supreme Court is when the number of justices that sit on the Supreme Court, which is currently nine, is raised to something other than nine. And it's bad for really three reasons. One is that it literally dilutes the importance of the Supreme Court of the United States for some temporary political objective. Um, secondly, it literally politicizes the United States Supreme Court for uh, which undermines the Supreme Court's integrity. Third, inevitably, it's going to necessitate and require retaliation from the other side, which is going to increase the number of Supreme Court justices even more. And that, in, in the end, is going to create something that we don't even recognize as a Supreme Court right now. It's going to be more like a super legislature. And we already have a legislative branch. So packing the Supreme Court hasn't been done, though it's been threatened. We've had the same number of justices for, I believe, about 150 years. And it would be really bad to do this. And I can show you why using history. If you look at the blog site, thecivilrightslawyer.com, you'll see the article that I just put up today here on this rainy Sunday when my mind's working and I'm sitting here in the office. Um, writing things, obviously, packing the court and why it's bad. And I kind of go through that. And one of the first things that I get to is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I think all sides can agree that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a smart justice. And she's also really the reason why we're, we're at this point. Now, she was asked about packing the court. In fact, the Democrats were threatening to pack the court in 2019 while she was still alive and still on the bench. And if you look at the post that I wrote today, I quoted her in here. And this is from an NPR um, interview with Justice Ginsburg. And she's quoted as saying that she does not favor proposals put forth by some Democratic, it should be Democrat presidential candidates who have advanced changing the number of Supreme Court justices if the Democrats win the presidency. And she has been no stranger to speaking her mind in politics. As they noted, she had criticized the, uh, candidate Donald Trump several times back in 2016. She said nine seems to be a good number. It's been that way for a long time. She said, I think it was a bad idea when President Franklin Roosevelt tried to pack the court. Here's the thing is Joe Biden has said that he's not going to answer the question about whether or not he's going to pack the court until the day after he's elected. Well, even the most far left member of the United States Supreme Court that there's ever been, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, thought it was a terrible idea. Now, Joe Biden, obviously not the smartest presidential candidate that any side has ever had. He won't answer that simple question and until after he's elected, he says. So assuming that the threat is real, that he does intend to pack the courts, what does that mean in layman's terms for most people? Well, all it means is that he's going to increase the number of justices. Now, the original constitution, the constitution that describes and sets up um, the, the court system, it didn't specify any particular number of justices. It left the administration, the logistics of that to Congress. So Congress is the, the one who set it at, at nine. Obviously, it has to be an odd number because you can't break a tie vote with an even number. And so we've had nine, even get Justice Ginsburg thought nine was a good number. So in order for Biden, assuming that he had control of Congress to, to be able to, to increase the number of justices, he'd have to add like four justices. So if, if Judge Barrett were, um, is on the court, he'll need four more justices in order to create a 7-6 majority, um, liberal or leftist majority, to vote in his favor on things. So he'd have to add basically four Supreme Court justices of his choosing. And that's what he's threatening to do. That's what it means to pack the court. 
And he's not the first Democrat president to threaten that. Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, did the same thing. And I discussed this in the article. But if you look back, we're talking 1930s America. What was going on at the time? The Great Depression. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was very much a, a socialist, or at least um, in favor of socialist policies, he didn't have any, any problem with using sociali socialism and socialist programs to achieve his political objectives. So he's creating all of this legislation, which we refer to as the New Deal, um, the New Deal era, to... Um, to achieve all these things that he's looking to do. And I'm not here to talk about the New Deal era because it's the absolute most boring um, portion of any American history class. But I think we need to look at the, the general uh, process of what was going on because that's interesting and that exactly pertains to what's going on now. So he's creating all of this legislation during the Great Depression and what's happening is that the Supreme Court is striking a lot of it down is unconstitutional. And what was going on in the court, they had nine Supreme Court justices, but at that time, there was a conservative majority. And in fact, there were four particular justices. Let's see, I wrote their names down in, in this post. They called them the Four Horsemen. So it was Butler, McReynolds, Sutherland, and Willis, or excuse me, Willis Van Devanter. So they were voting to invalidate most of the New Deal legislation. And FDR, his response to that was, well, the hell with them. Let's create more justices. Let's let, let me nominate more justices so that we can get a majority on the Supreme Court and they'll stop. Uh, invalidating all of my legislation. That was his response. So basically, just like Biden, if the Supreme Court is going to go against us, then let's just increase the number of justices that I get to appoint, and now we'll have a voting majority, just like he's dealing with the legislature. Of course, the problem is, is that the courts aren't supposed to be involved in this sort of policy enactment in the first place. They're just supposed to interpret them and uh, as opposed to the Constitution to see w whether or not they are unconstitutional or they're constitutional. They're not supposed to be a legislature and they're not supposed to be acting like a legislature. So FDR um, created this new legislation that he was proposing called the Judicial Procedures and Reform Bill of 1937. And that basically one component of that was going to increase the number of justices. And the way that he did it was not to directly admit that he was, quote, packing the court. And the, the funny thing is, is that Democrats now are admitting exactly what they want to do, that they do want to pack the court for political reasons. But FDR was much smarter than that. He went about it indirectly and feigned concern over the age of the justices, how many of them were over 70 years old and they had been there for over 10 years. And that is publicly what he told the American public and also politicians and also the court itself about why he wanted to institute this reform that would increase the number of, of justices he got to put on the court, potentially. And from what I can tell from, from reading some of the, the history books on this, it was a huge, huge, huge um, crisis in, in politics and a constitutional crisis, really, because he attacked the court directly and it put the Supreme Court justices themselves in the spotlight and put them on the defense. And it lasted for, what was it? It lasted for, I think, 168 days. And if you look at it, basically all of the, the, the politics and the media coverage during this period 
was, I mean, it was like, it was like the impeachment of Trump or the impeachment of Clinton or even like coronavirus coverage. If you look at the, the posts that I wrote, I included one of the 1937 political cartoons. And I mean, it was just a, it ended up being a, a political disaster and it fell through just like Justice Ginsburg said, you know, the FDR was unsuccessful and it's a good thing that he was unsuccessful. But really, in the end, he got what he wanted because he so threatened the Supreme Court justices and really threatened them directly that in the end, they kind of sort of uh, ended up changing their, their views a little bit, changing their votes and his legislation ended up getting through that he wanted to get through. And uh, it, it sort of went away. But here we are. Everything goes full circle. If you look at the, the bottom of the, the article that I wrote, I cited a 2005 Smithsonian Magazine article called When Franklin Roosevelt Clashed with the Supreme Court and Lost. And this is a good article. I, I quoted a little bit of it, but... I recommend the article because it's from 2005. You know that the academics writing at Smithsonian Magazine would not write this today. I don't believe that they would because politics has gotten even worse since 2005 and it's gotten way worse since 1937. And I don't know that the academics would admit this. But the gist of the article is how kind of we dodged a bullet as a country. Our Constitution dodged a bullet because this legislation didn't pass. And FDR was a very powerful president, um, probably the most powerful president that we've ever had as far as how aggressive he was in taking power for himself and trying to intimidate the other branches of government. But the guy who wrote this article, he, the last couple of pa paragraphs I included in this post, and it, it's at the civilrightslawyer.com. It's the most recent post. But they really ring true today. He wrote that the nasty fight over court packing turned out better than might have been expected. The defeat of the bill meant that the institutional integrity of the United States Supreme Court had been preserved. Its size had not been manipulated for political or ideological ends. So isn't that exactly what's happening here today is that the threat on the table is to manipulate the institution of the Supreme Court of the United States for purely political reasons. And as I've said many times before, legitimacy is the currency of the courts. The Supreme Court does not have its own army to enforce its orders. If a president or a legislature or the people decide not to follow its orders, although it may have um, U.S. marshals and small numbers in certain places, it doesn't have an army. And without legitimacy, nobody is going to follow the, those orders. It's going to be destroyed from within by a lack of credibility. And we were warned in 2005 by this guy at the Smithsonian Magazine and by many historians that have researched what happened in 1937. Um, this man also wrote, the, the 168-day contest also has bequeathed some salutary lessons. It instructs presidents to think twice before tampering with the Supreme Court. FDR's scheme, said the Senate Judiciary Committee, was, quote, a measure which should be so emphatically rejected that its parallel will, not, will never again be presented to the free representatives of the free people of America. And it never has been. Again, he's writing in 2005 here. He also wrote, courts are not the only agency of government that must be assumed to have the capacity to govern. These are lessons for the president and for the court as salient today as they were in 1937. So that was advice from the Smithsonian historians in 2005. And I suspect you won't hear such things now in 2020. 
but it's a very dangerous thing that's on the table as even the most liberal justice of all time had warned against. It was a bad idea in 1937, and it's a bad idea now. Why? And what will the effect be on you? Say if Biden has, if, if Biden does somehow win and get control of Congress and he is able to increase the number of Supreme Court justices. What is the effect of this Biden majority, super majority on the Supreme Court? Well, let's look at gun rights. Um, gun rights, basically, um, you'd have a seven, six, seven to six liberal or progressive majority. And there are already what several Supreme Court justices that are on there now that believe that the Second Amendment applies only to a group of militia which don't exist anymore, and that there is no individual right for you or for I to even possess a firearm. And can you imagine if that were extended to being a majority of, of, a, of the Supreme Court, you literally would have no Second Amendment rights. Those wouldn't apply to you. Those would only apply to a militia, which they know doesn't exist in the same meaning as it was used in the Second Amendment. A free speech. Free speech would probably be non-existent. Um, you'd, you'd have a majority that now would look to overturn the 2010 uh, Citizens United decision. You'd have... Um, laws against free speech being upheld around the country and in places like New York City that would require people to use preferred pronouns, even if they don't believe that there's 10 or 15 different genders, things of that nature. That would be a preview of coming attractions. You would really have no free speech rights. Um, what else? Abortion. Obviously, Abortion is a big topic when it comes to the Supreme Court. But you would have something like Governor Northam, who believes that there is a constitutional right, even though the Constitution doesn't mention abortion in any way, a lot of these people think that there's an, a constitutional right to kill a baby even after it's born. And if you have a supermajority on the Supreme Court of people who feel this way, what is going to, to happen in the future? You, you, won't, you won't even have the ability of, of states like West Virginia, who are very conservative on issues like this and believe in the right to life. And say the West Virginians, through our legislature, we pass a law that says, well, I think it's probably law now. I mean, if you try to kill a baby that is just born, I mean, it's, it's going to be murder under the laws that we have right now. Well, under a, a Biden's version of an FDR packed court, you, you have you very well will have a court that says that you cannot outlaw that because a woman has a constitutional right to ask the doctor to kill that baby that was just born. And I don't know that that's even an extreme view. I think they probably would admit, as uh, Ralph Northam did, that that is how they see things. Uh, religious liberty. Um, there were several religious liberty cases, such as Hobby Lobby, Little Sisters of the Poor, that were very closely decided. And it would be safe to assume that these decisions are going to be would be reversed under this packed court. The understanding that we have of the right to practice religion would undergo major change. Um, the the churches that are even out there now um, are are being attacked constantly for having religious ser services during this so-called pandemic. They're being attacked viciously, even here in our our own state, by our own so-called Republican governor. Could you imagine? the viciousness that could be leveled at them with a seven to six Joe Biden Supreme Court. Election laws, election laws, all these issues over voter ID, illegal aliens voting. What way do you think uh, those are all issues that make it up to the United States Supreme Court? 
Um, I think it would be so bad that you would basically end up with an entire, our entire country having one party rule. It would be a lot like California. So who, who do you complain to? Who do you complain to? Well, well, you can't. It, it's, it's basically like animal farm as George Orwell wisely wrote about. Um, and initially there's a set of rules that sounds good and they change and they change over time until the pigs live a great life and everyone else in the, the barnyard um, struggles and they're basically the peasants. And you know, some animals are more equal than others. And that's the road that we're heading down. So to make a long story short, packing the court is just increasing the number of Supreme Court justices. And while it's technically and theoretically allowed because our Constitution doesn't require only nine Supreme Court justices. It's a bad idea because it's literally politicizing the Supreme Court for some temporary political purpose. It is, uh, secondly, undermining the integrity of the Supreme Court. And third, you know that there has to be and there will be retaliation from the other side no matter who packs the court. Because the other side, as soon as they get back in power, they're going to have to pack the court too. It's too late um, at that point. The the battle has has begun, and both sides will continue packing the court on and on, if they can, until we have this basically a super legislature, and our 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 form of government as we as we know it now is pretty much gone at that point. So that's my my spiel about packing the courts. I uh, appreciate you watching. Make sure to uh, subscribe if you're on YouTube and set your notification to let you know when I go on a live video. And tomorrow, tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m., I'm going to have a live video with Benjamin Hatfield Esquire on, who is a a attorney in West Virginia who's running for prosecuting attorney of Raleigh County, West Virginia. And if you don't know where that is, that's Beckley, West Virginia. And it's been, it, it's been on YouTube here th this past week. And it's been in the news this past week, because that is where this uh, family court judge search video occurred. And I think it highlights the importance of these prosecutor races around the country. And that's what we're going to talk about. If you've seen what has happened with the Rittenhouse situation, if you've seen what's happened with the McCloskeys in Missouri now getting indicted, now you ought to realize how important the position of your local elected prosecuting attorney is. In West Virginia, we call it the uh, prosecuting attorney. In North Carolina, it's called the district attorney, but it's the same thing. The state level prosecutors are elected, and usually those are are uh, th there are political party affiliations to those races. For instance, what, the race uh, that we're going to talk about tomorrow in Raleigh County, it's um, Ben Hatfield is a Republican nominee running against the Democrat nominee for prosecutor. So you might ask yourself, well, what does that have to do with politics? What is different about the Republican prosecutor versus the Democrat prosecutor? And that's a good question. We're going to talk about that. And I'll ask you to, to, to think, think about yourself where these injustices are occurring, where people are being charged for defending themselves, exercising their natural rights, what political parties are the prosecutors there? And why are their policies different? Why are their um, ideologies different when it comes to constitutional rights? This is, there's, this is one of the, the biggest, um, these should be the most important races, really, aside from the presidential race that, that we pay attention to, because nobody has more power over you really, than, than the prosecutor in your jurisdiction. They have ultimate power, ultimate discretion. If you're involved in a self-defense shooting or anything, really, they make the decision. 
basically of of whether to be you, you get charged with it or whether you're not charged with it, whether you're free or you're not free. And politics does play or can play a big part in those decisions. It it's no coincidence that George Soros and you can Google this, he's been funding these prosecutor races all over the country. He's been funding these progressive, liberal, leftist prosecutors, just like you see, just like you might find in some of these um, Rittenhouse or McCloskey examples, or even, even Baltimore. Um, he's funding these sorts of races under the radar all over the country. So it's time to wake up. You need to wake up and pay attention and see, is there a prosecutor race this election cycle in my AO? And if so, what's their political affiliation? Is somebody running against them? So you need to find these things out before you go in the voting booth and, and just guess on a name that it's time to wake up and to educate yourself and your neighbors on these prosecutor races. Because, and, and if you don't know, if it's an, a non-affiliated race and you don't know the politics of, of your prosecutor, you need to ask them ASAP. And if they won't answer questions, and we can talk about what questions you can ask them, but if they don't answer questions, then, then you, you might not want to vote for them. So again, that's going to be tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. So I appreciate you watching. And sorry, I'm I, I, uh, not really getting into any uh, questions on this, but tomorrow hopefully we'll, we'll have plenty of time. And then also on the 19th, I'll be doing another live video and a freedom rally with um, Marshall Wilson, who's running for governor in West Virginia. And that's going to be in Lewisburg, West Virginia. We're going to meet right in front of my Lewisburg, West Virginia office. That's on Court Street, downtown Lewisburg, right across from the old Lewis Theater, very close to the courthouse. And we're going to do a live rally, live YouTube video with Delegate Marshall Wilson. And we're going to demand that the state, that the governor open the state back up. Um, West Virginia, I don't mean to go down a, a COVID tyranny rant, but I could for at least an hour. West Virginia has been nominally impacted by COVID-19, but we've been drastically impacted by having our state locked down by a governor who is in really enjoying life um, being the only person to run the government while the legislature is asleep at the switch. So it's time to demand that, and I think even, even the, a lot of the so-called progressives and liberals that I've talked to feel the same way, that, you know, what a lot of them have businesses, they need to earn a living as well. Um, the economic d disaster that, that they've caused, we may never recover from it. The businesses that have closed may never reopen, and it, it, it's ongoing. For instance, they're still prosecuting the military veteran elderly barber in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. I've seen news reports in recent days of other people who are threatened with prosecution for not complying with our, the lockdown orders in our state. It, it's really, really time to to uh, demand that all of these orders be rescinded immediately. I mean, hell, in, in Florida, they, they, we have way better numbers than, than they do all around, and they never locked down like we did. And they, they've already released all of the restrictions in Florida. And here, we, we're still closed down to a certain extent. And so if you feel strongly about that one way or the other, if you want to debate about it, October 19th in front of my office, downtown Lewisburg, West Virginia, and we can discuss it. You can talk to Marshall Wilson and see you know, what his beliefs are on the Constitution, on the role of government, and what he would do differently as governor and what he would do if he, if he were governor now. 
So thanks for watching. Uh, let's see. Again, tune in tomorrow night, 6.30. It's going to be on YouTube and Facebook. Make sure you subscribe or set your notifications so it comes on and reminds you. And if you have any if you have any good questions, write them down and bring them. Um, and this has to do, if you want to know what to ask your prosecutor candidate, if you have questions about prosecutors in general, we're going to discuss them tomorrow night. So thanks for watching. And, and uh, until next time, remember th to follow the guidelines and that freedom is scary, but it doesn't have to be. Thank you.